Okay, so this is an actual case we had um, a couple of years ago. A 16 year old schoolboy had a rugby injury less than four hours ago. He's a Frank or C. Um, that's his injury. So, um, three, four uh, facet dislocation. See, close up. It's a uni facet dislocation because here we can see two facets nicely superimposed. And here we can see one facet above it, so it can't be a bi facet, must be at least a uni facet. And here we can see the other facet sitting there. Huh? So it's a uni facet dislocation. And these are the questions which, um, which we sort of go through our mind whether we must give steroids, what dose of steroids, whether it needs a closed skeletal reduction, and whether we do an MRI before the open reduction or, or closed reduction. Here's the MRI on this patient, and you can see there's a so called disc of risk. It's extruding beyond the border of the inferior virtual body and running up the back. This is probably what one would, would classify as a disc of risk sign. Now, what do you do now? Do you do sword or close reduction or do you, um, you take in the theater, assuming that the expertise? So we can chat about these things. Um, I'm going to go through the, the management of a spinal cord injury overall and we can maybe come back to this case and, and discuss it, um, how, how we manage it after the talk. Um, let's get my menu out of the way. Okay, so spinal cord injuries obviously have been around since the beginning of mankind. Um, and although we haven't just found out a way how to treat the actual cord injury, we, we've learned a lot about stabilizing the visual column. And that's really the main say of our management nowadays um, and optimizing the spinal cord uh, improvement. Typical ratio, like all trauma, the males predominate. Um, usually self-stupidity, MVA falls, diving, blunt trauma. So it's almost always a case. Um, and it's got quite a high mortality, you know. Um, and these are significant injuries. So this is a typical etiology. Kurusku, MVA is most commonly sport. Um, gunshots are sort of new recreational activities. Uh, and diving every year, we have about four or five diving injuries, um, usually associated with a bit of clip drift. These are very costly injuries. I mean, the state's looking at $4 billion annually. It's an enormous amount of money. We get the two um, age distributions, the young patients, uh, usually the trauma, and the older people, usually the central cord injuries. So this is enormous socioeconomic in impact. Um, the UK as well. We haven't done a cost analysis in South Africa, but I can tell you that I looked at the cost on, of our ICU stay, um, and it's about uh, about twenty four thousand, um, I think about twenty four thousand per patient per day uh, for spinal cord injury in the unit, and in the general ward it's about five thousand a day. These patients stay for several months at times in the ward, so that, that cost racks up. And that's not to mention the, the cost of them going to rehab. And, and, and also the cost of the community. Now they're all going to disability grant, they're not earning anymore. Uh, so it's a massive um, dent in our fiscus for these patients. And all of these are basically preventable injuries. So outcomes, well, you can't really change a cord injury, but early recognition is important. Resuscitate the patients, stabilize the spine and try and prevent secondary injuries and avoid complications. And we'll go through a couple of those in the talk. So this is where we can maybe intervene this, preventing additional injury and avoid complications. So different mechanisms um, which cause a cord injury, you know, from contusion, um, which is a so most of our cord injuries are contusions. We have a cord swelling. Um, you'll see in the MRI the cord swollen with a hard signal on the T2 or the stir. Compression will occur when you um, when one has a burst injury and the actual canal uh, impinges on the cord. You may have a stretch injury and, and that would be commonly, we would see that in a sclerora type injury, such as pediatrics, where the, the ligamental structures are quite flexible and although you may not have a catastrophic uh, dislocation, um, you have a, a, 
the stretch which doesn't tear the fibers, but the cord is not stretchable and gets damaged. Laceration we find with um, obviously gunshots and stabs. And secondary injury, that, well, that's our biological response to the primary injury, and that's where a lot of research went into trying to prevent that from happening. Okay, so mechanical pathophysiology, um, that's direct tissue um, disruption of the cord. Um, you may have a you may have an unstable spine, so you have instability causing motion stretches to the cord, and you may have persistent compression. So in this case, you you saw that even though the patient's the injury's passed, there's still residual material compressing the cord. And this results in edema of the cord, necrosis, and, and so on, and obviously ultimately death of the cord. There's a lot of uh, biochemical changes which occur, which um, also contribute to cord uh, injury. So, you know, the whole inflammatory cascade with lysosomes assimilating hydrolases and enzymes and metabolic activities affecting the cord, uh, and membranes break down and so on until we have um, more damage. And this is where a steroid are targeted to try and prevent this cascade occurring and then. Um, uh, in an effort to improve outcomes. Hemodynamic uh, changes with spinal cord injury, these are things we can maybe try and affect. Um, obviously, if you, if you damage your cord, you, you lose your, your vasomotor tone, um, and which increases, which in turn causes decreased perfusion to the cord. Uh, when can try and maintain oxygen tension and so on, and orbital regulation, these are all affected, um, and so on. The problem is, um, <clears throat> you know, we know there's very poor correlation between actual cord injury and, and the clinical findings. You can have a patient with, uh, you know, like think of a stab, the brown, the brown cord injuries, they often get stabbed and they end up with immediate, you know, uh, hemiparalysis, but they, most of them recover for some reason. So correlation is very poor. And Bowman <clears throat> did a lot of work on, on his beagles and dogs, and um, he, he had a couple of models. And he found that in his in, in autopsies, even though there's, there's gross neurological loss, such as complete paraplegia or quadriplegia, is often the cord is intact. Um, so he thought this, this is his explanation that there must be other mechanisms causing cord damage. This is ischemia and mechanical compression rather than direct disruption. So he had a couple of models of the pro beagles. Um, we had, we had basically through an angio approach, um, put pressures on the, on, the, on the dog's cords and maintain the pressures for different times to replicate a sort of acute and subacute cord compression. Um, you find that once you release the pressure, most of the time the beagle is recovered, um, especially with central cord syndromes. Um, you had a couple of different models. One was an acute contusion model, so with acute impact of the cord, Greater the force, you have greater neurological damage and obviously more time to recover. He also had a compression model where he had a slow sustained pressure um, and he showed that recovery was possible in a scenario, but there's quicker recovery once you took the pressure off. So, I mean, I guess it's pretty self evident. So he did demonstrate that incomplete injuries can recover, and we see that in our patients. You know, patients incomplete often will have some recovery. Um, <clears throat> And there's different degrees of recovery depending on how much contusion you had and how much compression. But it's important that, that if you have residual compression of a cord, uh, that can inhibit optimal recovery. So that's obviously it's good news to surgeons because we want to take the pressure off the cord and try and improve recovery. So compression may physiologically block the cord function, and may prevent proper vascularization, the cord remains ischemic and so on. So um, so even, even if there's clinical plateau, even if, if the clinical recovery plateaus, one may still at a later stage affect a decompression, which um, may result in, in improvement in neurology. Okay, so Bowman showed his beagles that even late decompression in incomplete injuries, there is some further recovery. So all this is good news for the surgeon because we like to decompress. <clears throat> okay, so Onto the, um, this is a clinical evidence, the, the, the very large multi-centric trial called the Staskos trial. 
they found that um, early decompression is safe. We always used to argue about, you know, a patient comes in with spinal cord compression, don't get it too early, let the cord recover. They haven't found that. They found that early decompression is safe and is associated with improved neurological outcomes. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the first 24 hours is quite, quite critical that you have better outcomes if you do it early than delayed and conservative treatment. So everything's pointing towards the earliest decompression possible. How do we affect decompression? So we can do it indirectly. So the patient with a dislocated neck, the cord's compressed. You can we can align the canal with, with the relocation. And um, <clears throat> it's very simple. You know, medical students can do it. Some British trials can do it. Um, and it's the quickest way of, of affecting a, a decompression. <clears throat> Direct decompression you need to go to OR. Um, you need to open the neck or, or the spinal cord. That needs a bit more skill and expertise. But I think all, <clears throat> all clinicians and doctors should have an understanding of cervical traction and if necessary, be able to affect an indirect decompression. <clears throat> okay, so what about steroids? Um, I think largely now we, we all understand that steroids don't work, but I'll just go through the background because there's some, um, patient, some doctors saw seem to throw it around. <clears throat> so we know that anti-inflammatory properties of steroids have been gained since the 1960s. Uh, it stabilizes membranes, um, they maintain the blood pressure blood spinal cord barrier and hopefully decrease vasogenic edema, improve spinal cord blood flow, and inhibit endorphins, scaring. So a whole lot of good effects steroids have got. <clears throat> and the rationale is that they should reduce spinal cord edema uh, the same way you use them to reduce the peri tumor edema in the brain. And the rationale is that in the spinal cord that's useful and that will improve recovery. Okay, so <clears throat> Um, there were some studies in dog models that showed some um, modest improvement and that has been extrapolated to humans. So the NASCAR trials came about and um, <clears throat> Bracken was a great uh, proponent of this. He looked at high dose steroids versus standard dose steroids, multicentric randomized trial, looked very strong on paper, and they didn't find any significant difference um, in recovery in motor or sensation steroids. That's very disappointing to the steroid companies, so never give up. Um, uh, look at the fatality rate, also pretty high, and there's some complications with the steroids. So try it again in the NASCAR 2 trial. Um, a, lot of, a lot of patients here, yeah, 187 patients. <coughs> they looked at three different uh, things, this, uh, methylphenolazone, naloxone, and placebo. Um, Steroid dose was 30 milligrams a kilogram stent, 5.4 milligrams per kilogram per hour for 23 hours. Those are big doses. And they look at these patients at six weeks to six months. <coughs> they, so they found that patients uh, with motor complete, no difference at six months. Um, in the incomplete score lesions, there was significant improvement of the steroids over the placebo and the naloxone, but there's also different surgical management. So that would be a very strong study at all. <clears throat> they did find that um, these patients had a lot of complications, high wound infection rate, um, and the data was difficult to really get conclusions out of it. So that is largely discarded. Then came up the NASCA 3 trial, um, looked at also almost 500 patients, early treatment with steroids, and this sounded very promising. Um, they found that you must do it within three hours, um, otherwise no benefit after 24 hours. If your treatment is between uh, th is between uh, between three to eight hours, there's a moderate benefit if you treat up to 48 hours. There's no controls in these groups, only very high dose versus a low dose, and one year no functional difference between the groups. So you might get a tiny bit of um, motor recovery, but not a functional difference. A lot of other trials, a lot of other uh, authors of the trial steroids, uh, Bowman showed no improvement. He did find a lot of GRT side effects, and so on. A lot of, so other authors did not manage to reproduce these findings, and um, they definitely found immune response problems, pneumonia, increased hospital stay. So complications. Um, this is another study which showed increased infection rates. So 
this is a good summary of our um, this author. When he surprised that these papers even got past the referees, um, and he showed that this basically these papers are pushing because of bias and opinion, and it wasn't science. He's quite scathing about it, um, and um, basically they've been discarded. So in summary, steroids. Um, there's some suggestion that you do have an effect um, with me so specifically methyl prednisone if you give it within eight hours of spinal cord injury. It's not been proven though. There's no rigid evidence for that. Um, and the only real evidence is that they have significant side effects, far more than any clinical benefit. So that's what you want to give your uh, 40 milligrams of depot. That's how much you need to give as patients a stat dose. Okay, most hospitals don't even carry that amount in there. Supply. So it's a huge doses. We don't use it and we haven't used it since basically ever. Okay, so we know the hemodynamic part of the injury is important. We need to manage that um, and, and so on to optimize the perfusion and recovery of the cord. So ischemia is, is now thought to be one of the, the most important contributors to injury deficit. Uh, and hypertension after cord injury should really be avoided at all costs. Uh, so that's what you need to be very aggressive uh, to manage. So you want to maintain your mean arterial blood pressure at 85 to 90 for at least uh, several days to try and improve perfusion and ultimately your neurological outcome. How do we evaluate these patients? Okay, so you need to know the mode of, in of injury, the amount of en energy um, which patients sustained, how long since injury, it's, it's also important, um, we've documented, especially now with this, you know, this uh, constitutional court ruling about the four-hour rule, time is obviously critical. So don't forget to still go through ATLS um, and, and, and rule it out. Children don't often have spinal cord injuries, um, they have a very low proportion, but if they do it, it's usually predominantly cervical, they've got a large head and they're a disproportionate amount of sclerotic injuries and and uh, and they're also complete because you know um, they've got a large head to body ratio um, and the ligamentous structures are very elastic and they'll have often have these catastrophic stretch injuries i think we see a couple of cranial cervical dis dissociations that red cross every year um, and those that survive it often have quite catastrophic cord injuries Examine the patients. First thing you want to assess is your blood pressure and pulse. Look for signs of spinal shock. Examine them. So always log roll the patient, uh, mobilize the head, palpate the back of the spine, bogginess, gap, and tenderness. That's medical student level. Do a neurological examination, uh, power sensation, reflexes, and a PR. Eh? So uh, uh, how we classify as injuries, we've got the Asia score, that's what we use. The Frankel is the oldest scoring system. And uh, you need to just know about it, but we don't we, we use Asia in our, in our unit. So here's our, our Asia scoring system. Um, and it's fairly similar, similar to the Frankel, where an A is complete, no motor, no sensory, B is uh, incomplete, where motor is zero, but there's some sensation, and um, a C would be motor present but useless, a D is motor present uh, useful but it's not normal, and a D is normal. The difference in Asia is that, um, so the Frankel looks at the last um, functional segment. So if you say you're a, a C6, um, on the Frankel grading, C6 level would be, can be weak on the Frankel, eh? it can be like a, a, a three out of five power so on. Whereas in Asia, it's the last normal level. So the C6 would have to be normal level to call it a C6 complete. So Asia looks at the last normal level, where Frankel looks at the last, um, level, which is any motor function whatsoever. Okay, so imaging, um, obviously if you get trauma views, AP lateral open mouth, make sure you can see some hypothetic junction. So X-rays will show you indirect signs of, of disco ligamentous injuries and cord, and they, they're unreliable for cervical thoracic because often you can't see and, and, uh, and uh, cervical thoracic junction. Big shoulders, you often can't visualize nicely. So uh, don't forget your lines. We, we, you know, it sounds obvious, but I've seen guys in a tour meeting time and time again. You get it. Just go through basics. You won't miss it. Eh? Soft tissue line. Um, so 
the measurements are always sort of in the back in terms of you know where must it be in the thickness net. So rocket and green describe a ratio of 10, 5, and 15. Okay, it's quite easy to remember. 10, 10 in front of C1, um, below C1 to C4, 5 millimeters, and 15 below it. 10, 5, and 15. It's quite a nice way of remembering it. Um, the other ratios as well, but that's what I use. So soft tissue line, antibody line, post body line. This line most people get wrong is the spinal lamina line, okay? That's it there. So where you get confused is you're seeing um, the facet joints that often confuse people. They could, that's nothing to do with it. It's a base, it's a basic line between the base of the spinous process and the lamina, okay? And the easy way to find it is to look at C2, which the facets aren't uh, overlapping, so they don't get in the way. And you can see a nice clean line, it follows from C1, eh? and then you can pick up the line of your eyes and you follow it down there, that's the spinal lamina line. Not this line here, okay? And the reason why do we go why do I go about the spinal lamina line? So it's very useful to see if there's any partial element disruption again. Okay? Um, so it's not too fast. So, so the next, so it, it tells you if there's any fracture in the arch. Um, so if you've got a dislocation and your spinal lamina line is, is, is intact, so everything's gone forward, but this line remains intact, it means your partial elements have dissociated from that body, okay? There's a fracture somewhere. So it's a useful line. The last line is, is not the spinous process line, it's message line attach. The spinous process has different lengths, it's a useless line. So the lines of, of um, convergence are more useful. Basically, a line taken through the body um, to the spinous process. And it just draws your eye to the, the curvature of the neck. Is it lordosis? Is there segmental kyphosis, which you can pick up and, and, and recognize maybe unifacet desiccation or a subtle subluxation? That's the lines of convergence. Okay? Other things to look at in the x ray or your. Uh, your, your disc spaces, um, you want to check that the, the body's all nice and square, there's not a blunting around in the corner. And other things in lateral to look at, obviously your ADI, don't forget that. Look at your peg. So the back of the peg should always be a straight line. From the back of C2, you want a straight line up. That's how the peg sits. It's a nice vertical line. Um, if it's any step in the line, you won't want a peg fracture and so on. And also the peg should aim towards the, the, the tectorium here, yeah? tectum. And if you break it alignment, that means obviously the, the apical, apical ligament's gone and there may be craniosalical dissociation. If you see that, just cast your eye over the, the C, naught C1 joint, the clavicle condyle to make sure it's nicely located into the socket of C1. Um, you don't see any asymmetrical gap. Okay, so other things to look at. So that's your spine, that's your cord runs between the back of the body and the spinal, um, spinal lemon line. That's just basically your cord. Yeah? AP is, is also quite useful. Look out for a, maybe a dish of arc of river song. But the most important things are your spinous processes, your next sure all alignment and not displaced. That's a typical vertebra from the front. You can see the anchor vertebral joints going up on each side. Um, just, just, just recognize those. That's your ribs and that's where your lungs sit. Open mouth view. Um, so you can see your peg nice, your lateral masses. Make sure the joint space is nice and symmetrical. You don't see any overlap on the sides. Remember, you got a, your transverse ligament is attached here. So if you have a C1 burst fracture, it may rupture the ligament and this lateral mass will go sideways. If it goes, um, if it goes more than combined distance of that plus that more than 6.9 millimeters, it usually means that the transverse ligament is broken um, and it becomes an unstable injury. We can chat a bit about that later if you guys want. Okay. CT scan is very commonly used. I think most tertiary centers will probably default towards a CT scan. Um, shows the canal very quickly with the with a helical scan, and it's it's a, it's a great way of identifying sometimes very complex patient uh, fractures. Um, so yeah, the CT scan shows you nicely. You can first of all on the sort of parasagittal see the 
C0, C1 joint nicely. You can see here there's a facet which is a tip is perched and there's a fracture there. On the side, the fascia is, is, is just perched. And there you can see the burst fracture. So CT gives you great anatomy. Um, and there's a nice easy picture. You can see a nice facet which is dislocated there. And over here you can see it on the wrong side there. So, um, so x-rays, we do miss things up to 45% of, of x-rays, of, of, of dislocations we missed on a plain x-ray. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure that's because the x-ray is bad. I think people just don't look properly. They don't, they're not taught properly and they don't assess an x-ray properly. I can't believe you can miss a dislocation unless you can't see the, maybe the, the thoracic, cervical thoracic junction. In that case, you do a similar view. You see it. You, know, you should not just fob it off because you can't see it. Um, Anyway, MRI is uh, the last investigation we use commonly. This is much more time consuming. It takes about two hours, two around time to get a patient into a scanner. You've got to move the patient in and out so there's more chance of neurological injury. Um, but if you worry about soft tissue, that's the image of choice. And it can also give you information about the cord. So if it's going to operate on the patient, it's nice to know if there's a disc present or if the cord is swollen, if one needs to do decompression and so on. So very useful, but it does take time, and uh, that's important. So, so you can see a patient with a two, three, four, or five. It's a uni facet. Why am I saying it? Because you can see two facets are nicely superimposed. There's no rotation here, the rotation is below here. Huh? There's one, there's a facet which is nothing above it, but I'm seeing another facet here which has got something above it. So, one facet sitting in context is a uni facet. Yeah, we can see the, the MRI, you can see the, there's no disc prolapse behind the border of his body, so there's no disc at risk. It's obviously pulled the whole PLL up of the back and there's maybe hematoma here. You can see the cord will be compressed there. There we can see the facet nasty, so the MRI does give you information on the bones. You can see a, a nice facet which is perched here. Um, okay. Okay, so these patients are, are very unwell. A patient with cord injuries is, is a significant physiological insult. They have hypertension, they don't breathe properly, hypoxemia, um, and cardiovascular instability. And these patients need to be managed in ICU for the first 7 to 14 days. And that's international standard of, of care. Um, and and we, we, we do it with Kurosku and Fortin Tigerberg, often the patients are managing trauma. Um, and that's suboptimal. Um, okay, so spinal shock, that is basically a stunning injury to the to the cord. This is a physiological uh, or maybe even anatomical transection of the cord. So we have loss and depression of almost all cord activity, including the reflexes below the lesion. Um, so while the cord is in shock, you cannot say that it's complete or incomplete. Because the cord is not functioning to assess it properly. Okay, so spinal shock is a physiological problem, and and um, we find while in shock the reflex is all absent and they're flaccid. It's hypertermia, uh, loss of sensation. Once the reflexes start coming back, we can say the cord is uh, recovering and out of shock. It usually takes about a, a day or two to recover, and it starts, um, the first one to come back is your uh, bulbar cavernous reflex. That's the most distal reflex you can possibly test in the cord is a bulbar cavernosis, which is S234. Um, and that's the most distal reflex. It's the first one to come back. So that's why we, we, we gun for that reflex when we're trying to assess the patient's in shock or not. Okay, so um, reflexes distal and closest to injury are absent. Um, if you have a very high injury, you, you may have some distal reflexes present. You may even find reflexes proximal to the lesion, maybe a depressed so-called Sherrington phenomenon. Um, so if you have maybe a T11 or T12 cord injury, it's possible you can, um, and in shock, you, you probably will have bicep reflexes. Okay, so um, important to know that Depending on where your, um, where your level of your cord injury, it may affect your blood pressure in different, different, different methods. So low thoracic, uh, low thoracic cord injury, 
you saw with your upper your upper trunk um, vasculature intact. You only have pudding in the limbs. Um, the blood pressure will be low, but the higher you go up, the lower the blood pressure. So cervical lesion or a very low blood pressure. You may have um, cardiac depression. Um, your global blood pressure is poor with generalized lack of tone and so on. Okay, spinal shock um, can be prolonged with uh, sepsis and, and, and toxemia with all patients. Um, and so on. Important to know that if you have no recovery after 72 hours, then um, very little recovery is anticipated or predicted. Okay, it's pretty much a petition there. So, onto the bulbar cavernosis. So, basically, bulbar cavernosis reflex is contraction of the anal sphincter. If you stimulate the bladder trigone, like put it in the catheter, or squeeze in the glands, or clitoris and female. Um, if you have an absent bulbar cavernosis reflex, can mean spinal shock, or maybe called aquinas syndrome, or a coronus middleitis injury. Okay, once the bulbar cavernosis comes back, it means you have a spinal shock, and that's it. Then you can then declare what your, your neurological level is once you have a spinal shock. This is schematic showing the uh, cord. So the cord injury, we have uh, total dysfunction, we have spinal shock, and all the reflexes are depressed. Um, and then it settles down, and the proximal reflex is um, normal, or you may have very, you may have very brisk reflex at this because there's no um, cortical inhibition. Priapism um, with spinal cord injury is an important medical legal thing. We term it a high flow priapism. So you have abrupt loss of your sympathetic input into the pelvic uh, vessels. Um, so basically, you have uncontrolled arterial inflow into the penal sinusoidal spaces, and that causes priapism. And any lesion of spinal cord from brain temperature to cones can cause priapism. The important thing is it occurs immediately called injury and settles after a few hours. So if a patient has been in the middle of the hospital and been there for an hour or two, and then there's priapism, it means that cord is converted from possible injury to complete in the time during hospitalization. So it's, it's, it's always like that. So always, if you see it, document the time um, and, and obviously try and recognize that the injury has actually happened there. Um, either moving the patient and stable neck, or maybe the secondary uh, causes of cord injury, such as hypertension and, and poor oxygen delivery. Okay, so natural history of a cord injury often improves by a segment or two during the first day or so. Um, it, sorry, not improves, it, it rises. So the patient with a, a C6 level um, of, of cord injury. It may end up with a C5 after a day or two, um, and they may end up needing a ventilator after that. It can, it can descend down again, but it takes a lot longer. Okay, so I'm not going to go through how to examine the core. This is basic medical field and stuff, but it's just useful to, um, for yourself, for exam purposes, just to choose the key areas for each um, segment you want to examine. So you, you, can, you can do it with your eyes closed. Um, so, deltoid C5, C6 with extension, C7 elbow extension, C8 finger flexors, the middle finger, and T1 abduction. L2 hip flexors, 3 is L3 is a knee extension, L4 L ankle dorsiflexion, L5 picto, S1 plantar. How do we grade neurological injury? Okay, so we decide if it's complete or incomplete. Complete cord injury is no sensation or any voluntary motive caudal to the level of injury. Um, okay, so you need your reflex may return, you need an intact bulbar cavernosis, so you, you're out of spinal shock, and we call it the last level of partial neurological function. That would be the A to the Frankel score. And the Asia, the Asia score is the last level of normal neurological function. Okay, if you have a complete injury, the prognosis for further recovery is very, very poor. Probably about the order of 1%. So, incomplete spinal cord injuries, um, we'll chat about that. And so, that's some 
function, which is causal to the level of injury, after your bulbar cavernosis reflex is returned. The more function you have early on, and the faster recovery, the better the prognosis. I mean, that's pretty obvious. So any, any sacral sparing, any perianal sensation, or voluntary pinch, or even uh, an, an, any flicker of movement of the big toe, at least tells you some of the long tracts are intact, and there is some potential for improvement. So the incomplete syndrome you look at is central cord, anterior cord, branch cord, posterior cord, and the conus lesions. Central cord is very common. We see um, like in, in the, the non-COVID times, you see at least one or two central cords a week in the ASCII unit. Most common is usually an extension injury. Um, typically, it's the sort of um, middle-aged guys, um, smokers, Thinkers, they have quite a lot of spinal osteophytes, stiff necks, have a few beers and fall down, hyperextension injury in the head, and they come in um, with, a, with a cord injury. Okay, so the three um, things to remember is your the cord in, central cord injury is motor worse than sensory, upper limbs worse than lower limbs, and hands worse than uh, worse distally and proximally. Okay, so this has got a fairly good prognosis. Most patients do regain some function to the legs, they can walk, um, but their hands are often very poor and clumsy. Um, regarding these patients, you must decide if they need a decompression. So often we find that the core is, is not actually compressed, it's just swollen. So from time to time we'll elect not to do a laminectomy in them because the, the core is expanded. It's a, it's a fairly normal canal size, so we don't need to actually do decompression. Um, it makes no difference whatsoever. It's important though, just to confirm that they've got a stable neck, so you want to put them, uh, do an x-ray, direct lateral x-ray, and uh, once they can do it, do a flex x view to confirm it, there's no instability, but usually there are stable injuries uh, in terms of the cord function, <laughs> so the, the visual function. Uh, Anterior cord syndrome, this is what your one has damage to the anterior cord. Um, it can be a central disc prolapse, but you basically your anterior spinal artery is involved. So you lose motor function of the lesion and the preservation of the dorsal columns. The prognosis depends on how complete the lesion is. Coffee machine out there. So, anterior cord syndrome is the most common cord, cause after high impact trauma. Um, you know, if you have a quick recovery in 24 hours, obviously the prognosis is better, but in general, these patients do poorly. Um, we see a couple of them after uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm resection where you have a vascular insult and you have anterior cord um, infarct uh, due to the Segmentals of the aorta being uh, being clamped. Brown's cord is a, is a really popular central cord syndrome in the ASCII unit um, with a lot of stabs. You have a couple of weak. Um, you have ipsilateral motor weakness and loss of proprioception with contralateral loss of pain and temp because those farms cross over. And these patients usually <coughs> do very well. They're usually ambulatory. They're also very young patients, it often helps, but most of them tend to mobilize well and go on to um, rehab uh, and, and a good walking prognosis. Um, I'm not entirely sure why they end up walking so well. It may be um, neuroplasticity in the brain, which, which, which maybe recruits other fibers, but they seem to do well, which, which is bizarre. You, know, you cut the cord in surgery, it doesn't work here, but these guys get stabbed and they walk. So, I don't fully understand, but they, they usually have a good ambulatory prognosis. Okay, so posture cord syndrome, um, that's quite an uncommon one. It may be direct blow to the to the cord and posterior or a hyper extension uh, in the old back and uh, where you, you damage your dorsal column, so you lose your uh, vibration and proprioception. You have normal power, normal motor function, pain and temp. So usually your spinal thalamic tracts are intact. Conus medullary syndrome, you may see in the base of the conus, which is which is between T, T12 and L1. 
we you use your bladder function and bowel function. Um, remember, it's a, it's a mixed picture up there. So you have some upper motor neuronesian or motor neuronesian lumbar roots can be preserved. And uh, bulbar cavernosis may be permanently lost because it may be uh, affecting the actual um, roots directly. So a burst fracture um, around the thoracolumbar junction can cause a middle-aris, conus middle-aris syndrome. Cord aquina, like it's not really a cord injury, but um, I think it's useful to know about it. So it's a, it's a low motor neural lesions below the cord, and the cord L ends at L1. And your typical findings are um, your saddle anesthesia, severe pain, numbness, weakness, loss of biology, bladder bowel control. So once it's not a cord injury, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a root lesion. How do you manage spinal cord injuries acutely? Um, okay, so what can we do as clinicians? Positioning, raise the legs, um, try and improve the blood flow to the to the heart, you know, the, the blood be pooling in the legs, and maintain your mean arterial pressure over 85. Really important to keep the cord well um, well perfused. <clears throat> try and optimize, try and optimize it. Um, if you're batting to maintain your pressure, you can give adrenaline uh, infusion. And so these iron chaps are usually running for about a week. It's really important because this may improve your cord perfusion and ultimately your neurological function. Um, watch out for bradycardia. So typical spinal cord injury patients got hypertension with a bradycardia. You can keep your pulse rate at over 40. You can use atropine to help you uh, and so on. Okay, so I won't go too much on this. The spiritual support. Um, high lesions, so anyone with a lesion above C3, so your phrenic nerve is 3, 4, and 5. If you don't have any phrenic nerve, you're not going to breathe this off and you'll need permanent ventilation. But if you have your phrenic nerve present, so anything below sort of C5, the phrenic nerve is ventilating for you. You have diaphragmatic breathing, so as you Inhale, you, as you inhale, your diaphragm pushes down um, and initially your chest will collapse because it's been pulled in on a negative pressure. So you have paradoxical motion. If you breathe in, your chest comes in. If your diaphragm is pushing down, you're contracting it. So that's paradoxical. As, as your chest will um, become stiffer because the muscles atrophy and the joints stiffen up, the diaphragm becomes more efficient because the chest is a rigid bell. So your diaphragm motion can pump and the chest doesn't collapse in paradoxically. So you do take it, tend to get better diaphragmatic breathing as you as you get on. So it can take a period of days and weeks to, to wean these patients off for respiratory support. Initially, they have a lot of lung secretions. Um, the cough's very ineffective because they've got very few muscles not used to coughing. Don't forget now, if your entire breathing apparatus, apparatus is to rely on a couple of intercostals in your in your diaphragm, you're gonna you're gonna fatigue very quickly. But with time, those muscles get stronger, you get more efficient at ventilation, and you can often wean patients off a ventilator if they get normal lungs. Um, they often will have some uh, ventilator associated pneumonias, some VAPs along the way. We may have to give a couple of course antibiotics. Most patients will have at least one or two VAPs during the course of the time, and most patients spend at least about six weeks in the unit on a ventilator before we can wean them off. And that's, that's with a very dedicated team who's very good at weaning patients off ventilators. We do early tracheostomies uh, in these patients. It's just easier for secretions. Um, you decrease the dead space and all the, all the good effects of tracheostomy. Um, occasionally a patient has got a high injury so his basic his phrenic nerve is, is defunctioned and they'll need a permanent ventilator. Um, it's tricky, we have done a couple, um, mostly very young patients, and most of the time they you know they struggle out in the community. You need at least six carers to care for one patient, um, because each one, you know, you know, will spend one day looking after the patient totally, so you want to rotate around. Um, if you imagine the you know, the resource demands in our, in our community with power cuts and things, the ventilator, it's, it's a disaster. So very few end up going home in a ventilator. Um, 
In fact, a lot of our patients will, will actually wean. They, they start off having very high core injuries and you think we need a permanent ventilator, but often they'll, they'll breathe through their lives and sort of get off the ventilator themselves spontaneously. But the survival out there is very poor. Thromboembolism is a big problem with the patients. They obviously lie in, um, you know, recumbent, they've got no motor tone, um, blood pooling their limbs. They, they, because of the cord injury, they've got a real hypercagular, hypercagular ability about them with the trauma. And DVT is very common, up to 20%. And, and obviously PE. We've lost a couple of patients from embolism over the years. Um, your complete injuries at high risk and incomplete. Um, and these patients don't actually show swelling, so they, they may have fatal pulmonary, pulmonary emboli without any clinical signs of swelling in the legs. Remember, they can't also complain of pain, so it may be asymptomatic until they just, just die. So the organ clexane, um, very important, <coughs> TED stockings, and if you have pneumatic boots, uh, we're available. Gastric ulceration, we, we give uh, anti-acids, ranicidine, um, 50 milligrams at hourly. That's your uh, definitely need that because ulceration is a big problem. <coughs> In the first couple of, uh, of days, paralytic ileus is, a, is, a, is, is there. You might, you might need to use a um, nasogastric tube, these patients with a, with a descent bowel. Um, just be very careful. Now, these patients can have quite grossly distended abdomens and which impede the, the diaphragmatic motion and they're only breathing on the diaphragm and if their belly is stretching them, they don't breathe and, they, and they, they can get hypoxia very quickly. Also important to, um, to note that they may have acute abdomens and, and not have any symptoms because they can't feel it. So just be very vigilant if you, if you palpate them, percuss the abdomen, feel if there's any distension, take an x-ray if you're unsure, but you really could be very vigilant. I, I personally lost a patient years ago as a medical officer, I didn't understand it. Uh, he had a, you know, quite a swollen belly and uh, <clears throat> he didn't feel very sore, so I didn't pay too much attention to it and he had acute abdomen, so you can lose it. So there's a lot of uh, emphasis goes in the unit to training his patients um, with bowel retraining, they have regular animas, um, suppositories, stool softeners, the whole, the whole regime they go on. Um, and you try to stimulate them to become regular to, to, to basically avoid the bowels regularly. Um, these patients have negative nitrogen balance, they lose body mass like anything, um, rapid weight loss, so uh, they, do, they do become very prone for infection, and wound healing, you can't get them with ventilators, so you really got to make an effort to maintain nutrition with, um, with supplements quite important. Um, just a bit about the bladder. So neurogic bladder is a, is a big problem in, in, in the cord injury patients. Acutely you want to catheterize them, but long term you want to try and get them off with catheter. So we try and go on a, on a <coughs> bladder retraining program. All patients before they go to, um, before they discharge, will, um, will do the residual volume, so they'll, they'll pass urine and we'll catheterize them and see how much is left in the bladder. Um, if it's you know, less than 100 mils and they're fine, if it's more than 100 mils, they probably need a catheter because they'll end up with, um, with backflow and kidney problems. If the patients have a good hand function, they can do intermittent self-catheterization. Um, it depends on their, on their uh, neurological level. And there's a bunch, bunch of interventions that the urologist uh, can help with in terms of sphincters and so on and medication. But just understand that, uh, that the, 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 the neurogenic bladder is a big problem for these patients and there are a lot of complications that come from it. Okay, so chronic cord injuries. Um, these patients have contractures. I think all of us have seen the have done femorectomies at, at East River. They come in with their hip flexion contractures, knee contractures. They sitting in, in bed. They end up with pressure sores because they, they can't be turned properly. That's a major problem. So they all get contractions. So you have to be very careful to embark on early splintages, um, physiotherapy, OTs with the night splints and so on. 
partial hypertension, we see it from time to time. The patients, you can't set them up. Every time you set them up, they feel weak because of the, the poor vagal tone and the heart can't, can't actually catch up because it's got no uh, uh, innovation <coughs> and it can be quite severe with a partial hypertension. We used to have tilting beds in the old Kanwari units. We don't have them now anymore. And we lie the patient a special bed which is articulated so you can tilt them up and try and get them used to being uh, erect. So basically, you immobilize them slowly, slowly raise the head of the bed and, and tilt them and so on. Use abdominal binders to try and come, uh, you know, try and prevent distension of the belly and try and keep your blood pressure up. And you can use um, medications such as ephedrine for a while. Autonomic uh, dysreflexia, that's when you have, because of the lack of parasympathetic feedback, you have unopposed sympathetic activity. These patients can get severely ill. It's not a, it's not a joke. They can actually die. They can have seizures. They have hypertension crises. They can have a stroke and bleed from these unopposed sympathetic activity. <clears throat> the patient will present with headaches, sweating, flushing above the, the, the lesion, and, um, and below it they may have cold, um, cold uh, peripheries. <clears throat> Okay, so they may uh, sweating of the face, um, cardiac arrhythmias, and they, they're not well. Okay, so you recognize it early. <clears throat> um, you want to prevent them having a cerebral hemorrhage, seizures, and, and so on. And most commonly is caused by irritations, so often a UTI, so a block catheter or a, even a bladder stone, maybe fecal loading, and so on. Um, these are the most common causes. Or but also you want to exclude other things like toenails and anal fistulas and things. Anything which is irritating to the patient in general can cause this. But the most common things are, are urinary problems and fecal retention. So treatment is to monitor them, get calcium channel blockers, <coughs> ganglion blockers, and so on. And you may even have to treat the, the hypertension with, with medication as well on its merits. Spasticity can be a real problem with patients. It can be extremely sore. You know, you may you may just touch them, they end up with quite a severe total body spasm. Um, some even use a spasticity to help with a transfer. Um, but in general, it's, it's more problematic and useful. <clears throat> and uh, I know Judith uses baclofen often um, you know, orally to try and decrease spasticity. There are some patients one may end up putting an intrathecal pump with baclofen into the core to try and control the spasms, which can be quite quite disabling. Pain is very prevalent among these patients, even though they're paralyzed, they have chronic pain, which can come from the from the virtual column. Maybe it hasn't been fused properly, or there's a resulting uh, instability, and so on. And um, I think you need to, when you have a patient with chronic spinal pain, who's had a cord injury, just make sure they haven't got a, a syrinx, which, which you often can get as a post-traumatic event. <coughs> okay, and I spent some time with that. <coughs> as, these, as these patients get older, remember they're transferring, especially the paraplegics, they're transferring themselves in on a bed. They'll often have shoulder problems, impingement, um, Glenohumeral osteoarthritis, and it can be quite a problem. These patients are really dependent on the upper limbs. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure you guys have seen these uh, recumbent cyclists cycling around, uh, around the peninsula and these reclining bikes, and basically, guys pedaling with these upper limbs. And I just wonder how, much, how the shoulders wear out because they're doing an enormous amount of work. But they're, de they're fully dependent on the upper limbs, and um, they do get the degenerative changes. Uh, carpal tunnel and ulnar nerve problems. Um, as you get older, the urinary management becomes difficult, pressure sores are common, and often these patients will find themselves in a nursing home at a much younger age. I mentioned this before, so post traumatic syrinx is important. Um, this may represent the court injury which, which occurred initially, and this may be just be, um, you know, if you have necrosis of the of the dead part of the cord, but you can also get a secondary um, syrinx which can form years later as a result of maybe also CSF flow. And the problem with that is you can take away what little function you have left. So you have 
Um, so initially, if you can transfer um, with some triceps function, you may lose it as the syrinx grows. So be vigilant for that. Okay, so a small amount of, of post-traumatic syrinx has occurred. Um, you can shunt the syrinx. So it's often, often if it's treatable, it would be because there's obstruction to the normal CSF flow, and you may want to shunt it. Uh, and then try and prevent deterioration in neurological function, otherwise the syrinx may grow. Um, in terms of urological management, um, condom urinal is better if the patient has got hand dexterity um, than an indwelling catheter, or you can teach them to do intermittent catheterization, self catheterization. That's the most important way of trying to prevent them um, with chronic urinary strictures and so on from the indwelling catheter. This is a bunch of drugs, so I won't go through that. Hope you remember it. And um, in the quads, they often will end up with a superpubic catheter because a normal uh, urinary catheter has complications. And there's some surgical options we have for these patients. It depends on resources, even artificial sphincters implanted, artificial sphincters which um, you can use for some patients. But in our environment, unfortunately not. The importance of urinary management is you want to prevent kidney damage and you need to maintain surveillance of the entire patient's life. So you have to constantly make sure that they are draining, avoiding the bladder, they have with kidney stones, um, and they do, they get repeated UTI stones and the upper tracts dilate and end up with kidney failure. So to keep a close eye on them, make sure that they are um, <coughs> adequately self-catheterizing or at least voiding the, voiding the urine. A lot of patients will have asymptomatic bacteria. Um, treat the urea producing bacteria to try and prevent stones and the stones and infections can cause your autumn dysreflexia and so on. So these patients need to have regular urinary tract evaluation Hence, the importance of outpatient clinics at Western Cape with its dedicated uh, spinal cord injury team. You recognize this, this is an iron lung. Um, this is used in the days of polio. We don't really use this nowadays anymore. Okay, so uh, we have a couple of patients who end up with permanent ventilator. And you need a lot of carers, you need a very involved family and the care system around these patients. It's a, it's a huge um, a huge burden to carry, and, and most impoverished communities can't manage it. <clears throat> Our guidelines are if there's no brick shelter, no brick house, and no running water, patients do not get a permanent ventilator, they cannot function. So these carriers have to be trained to suction, bag them, reconnect them, train to check your tube. It goes on forever. So you need a very a decent, educated uh, carer and a bunch of carriers to make sure the patients can. In their home. Patients apparently do value their lives. Um, there are options of, phrenic, of a phrenic pacemaker. Uh, we haven't had one yet, but um, theoretically you can uh, it, you can pace a phrenic nerve. So the patient who needs a ventilator because they've got a high C3 lesion with no diaphragmatic motion, you put a pacemaker in, it'll make a diaphragm move and get them off a the ventilator. So that is an option. Um, but as I say, we don't have the resources in Africa for that. <clears throat> Heterotopic ossification, very common in spinal cord injuries. It's always below the cord lesion. They may have stiffness, swelling of the limb, inflammation, and you need to basically make sure you have an infection there, septic arthritis, or a fracture. So take an x ray, and, and you're probably seeing something like that. Um, and as I say, it's very common in these patients in the first, first year. So this is a differential of your heterotopic bone. So there's commonly fracture, um, cellulitis, joint diffusion, and so on. You can give non steroidals for it. We don't radiotherapy these patients. Um, it shouldn't add to disodium is how you treat them. Physiotherapy is very important to keep the range of motion game and prevent contractures and, and, uh, and nerve entrapment with, these, with the HBO. Okay, we spoke about spasticity, <coughs> so spasticity, 
does predispose you to contractures, pressure sores, and affects the patient's function. Management of spasticity is a regular stretching program, splints, and medication, often baclofen, most commonly used, even some low doses of, di of diazepam. Severe cases you may want to have an intrathecal baclofen pump to try and manage it, and occasionally rhizotomies. This is a proper rhizotomy, not the Mickey Mouse rhizotomy the guys are doing for back pain. This is a proper rhizotomy. We actually do a transection of the dorsal root ganglion in severe cases. Okay, so life expectancy. These patients, um, it's very hard to get a true grip on, on what our life expectancy is. Um, most patients just sort of disappear. You can't track them down. Um, but, but, you know, for the quads, we're looking about probably 60% don't survive the first year. And most commonly is because of respiratory complications, pneumonia, um, and, and septicemia from other causes, urinary septicemia or uh, pressure sores. That's the most common cause of death. So the attrition rate is very high. Um, and unfortunately, you know, a spinal cord injury in Africa is a death sentence. Average tetraplegic has got a very poor life expectancy. Paraplegic is obviously better. You can transfer yourself, it's more independent, and you're less vulnerable to all the complications that goes with it. Okay. Thank you. There's a whole bunch more for you, but I think it's enough for tonight. Um, unless somebody's got some questions. Uh, Okay, this is a chat chat. Okay. Okay. Okay, guys, thanks very much. I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, hopefully it uh, makes a complex subject a little bit more easier to understand. Um, but look, I mean, the spinal cord injury management question is very common in trauma meetings, eh? Um, so I'm actually not going to watch it from one of you. Um, you. You definitely will be asked management of spinal cord injury in the exam situation. You must note, you must know how to list its complications um, and how we treatment blood pressure control, oxygen, DVC prophylaxis, anti acids, pressure care, boom, boom, boom. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's easy money for that. It's easy marks. And um, I think. I think you can answer well at that. Okay, we'll call it a day there. Good night, everybody. And uh, we will see you we'll on campus.